if you go on uh, YouTube, you can catch the compartmentalized segments of the show. Dylan, after the show is over, will take each interview segment that we do and then they'll upload those to YouTube. And you'll notice that there are some times when the sound is muted on it. That's, those aren't mute button incidents. That's the music. The bumper yeah. music oftentimes is muted by YouTube because of rights to the music and such. So if you yeah. do go on the replays and you see that there's no sound for a while, that's the reason why. Yeah. Our next guest, who you'll introduce in just a second, came in and said he, en he was enjoying the off-air discussion. He should have been here before we started the show <laughs> this morning. <laughs> it was... It was I, don't I was know ready to leave. Me and Gilstrap <laughs> always wind up talking about the same thing that four-year-old boys would talk about if they were together, or six-year-old boys, whatever. I don't know why the path goes in that direction, but yeah. it does. Is it 12? Yeah. yeah, it always goes in that direction. Richard Dennis, out of the Attorney General's office, he has an office here in Martinsburg, is our guest uh, on the program. Richard, belly on up to your microphone a bit more there so we can hear you nice and clearly. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Good to be here. Great to have yeah. you here. And let me add... I'm a three cat family. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so you offended. So, John, you offended was, somebody else. I was listening coming in. I was totally offended. Well, yeah. Get over it. <laughs> oh, oh. What are the names of your cats, though, Richard? We have Tooties. We have uh, Grayson. We have. Uh, oh, you asked me too quick. I'm on the radio. Sadie. 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 Gracie, Sadie, and Tootie. Yeah. Tootie was a Mickey Mouse thing years ago when my grandson named him so okay yeah how long have you had the cats he's probably a 15 year old cat and the and the two sisters are probably three years old so but, so john offended a 15 year old cat this he morning. did he, he did. has no respect for age but i will add they serve a purpose we we live on I the side of the mountain <laughs> <laughs> and we no longer have ground moles we used to have ground moles that would burrow everywhere since okay. three cats no ground moles so, so they have a purpose richard just saying that uh, cats while annoying to some can be quite efficient uh, pets for very others. very much so and cheap <laughs> are, are, will you accept an apology from John Gilscrap now? I would. I would. Did I don't you know? expect to see one. But... <laughs> Gilscrap's pretty stubborn, so I don't think you're getting one. I don't, I don't think that's coming at all. Uh, Richard, obviously Patrick in, is in his last months as Attorney General, probably the next governor. We don't, you know, the election will determine that. What happens to the office once the Attorney General leaves? Does Is that office itself... Uh, dependent on who the governor is not necessarily the personnel but the existence of the office the governor or the attorney general i'm sorry the attorney general yeah. uh, our hopes are that it stays the same mm -hmm. i think you know the attorney general has done a great job with with what he's had here and uh we're one of the only state offices that has a an office in the eastern panhandle and our hope is that it stays the same but we don't know. That's kind of up in the air when the new attorney general comes in. Now, was Patrick the first attorney general to have an office in Eastern Penn? I believe so. I think you're right. I yeah. believe so. Yeah. Where are you located? They're out at uh, Aikens Plaza in the building with uh, Valley College, mm -hmm. right next to where uh, Shepherd College building was. And what is, is your, but and what is what is your job specifically? My job. I am I am a, a consumer advocate. I cover seven counties for the attorney general in the eastern panhandle. I've got Jefferson, Berkeley, Morgan, Hardy, Hampshire, Grant, and Pendleton. So consumer advocate, does that mean when I hear, you know, if you get a, 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 a prank you know, call or a scam call, you should report it to the attorney general's office? Would that go to you? Well, it would. It would. Um, there's not a lot we can do with those, but I do hear about those a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I, I get that call a fair amount. And people... We'll write down the numbers that it came from and everything. There's just not a lot we can do sure. with that. That's more of a federal level. And most of those are from overseas. Right. They're not they're not generated in, in the state. So not a lot we can do with that. What are the most frequent requests that you can actually handle and address? Um I get them from all across the board. I was I've been at the fair, I've done three weeks worth of fairs. Um robocalls is huge robocalls and everybody everybody wants to talk about robocalls and i know the attorney general along with 51 other 50 others are working diligently to to try to stop that uh i get a lot of scam calls and one of the biggest things i do is 
I go and visit every county at least once a month, and we have what we call mobile office hours. And so I'm sure you maybe have seen it in the journal where I, we're setting up our mobile office hours for people to come in if they have complaints, if they have some information they'd like to get to the attorney general. And normally when I do those, I do them at senior centers because sometimes you'll be at a courthouse for mobile office hours and nobody comes. When I go to the senior centers, I have a captive audience. And then I can also talk to them. I give them the same messages almost every month. Uh, please don't give anybody your information. Please, if somebody's asking you to give them, pay them anything in gift cards, turn around and walk away that there's no legitimate reason for anybody to ever ask you to pay them in gift cards. And I think that's a biggie. Uh, and I just and I go over some of the newer scams every month with them to let them know what to look out for. Yeah, we we make a joke half a year is about this Nigerian prince who will give you $10 million and you give them a few dollars in return. But the scams have become so sophisticated now. And uh, you have to read very closely to detect exactly where the mistake there is. So... How does someone, unless they're very, very, very astute with, with what they're reading, avoid the scams? Well, and it's tough, particularly for seniors, but it's not only seniors. Um, yeah. Another population that's very uh, college students. College students get emails offering them free stuff all the time, and they're getting scammed left and right because they're jumping on trying to get something for free. Um, but, uh, and I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. No, the, what do you do? And I was thinking the other day, uh, and my wife and I are fairly astute, and we're conscious of the scams everywhere around. But I got one from the, uh, uh, the Postal Service the other day. It was not from the Postal Service, but yet it implied that it was. Another one is from the uh, uh, PayPal. Not from PayPal, but right. for all the uh, cloakings from PayPal. And it, it, it approaches the fact that uh, you've, uh, uh, we, we've received your payment of $900 or X amount of money. Uh, and uh, we appreciate your business. We're getting ready to forward it. And, uh, and a very disclaimer, if, if you don't think this is right, call this number. And uh, your first reaction was, it's not right, so I'm going to call the number. Yes, and that's the worst thing you can do. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and I hear that that's happening all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, my biggest, one of my biggest messages is nobody's going to give you nothing for free. Yeah. Um, you have to realize that. As much as we would like to think we're back in the 1950s and people were generous and people were giving you things, that's just not happening today. So when you see something and it's too good to be true, then it is too good to be true. But the ones that I just mentioned, Richard, is just the opposite of that. They're not giving you something for nothing. It leaves the impression you've already done something. Yes, it sir. It could be a mistake on their part, and you make the phone call trying to p correct the error, which, which is what they want you to do. So, yeah. And I get those all the time also from the U.S. Postal Service, from FedEx, saying, We've tried to deliver your package, yes. and your package, and you need to call us because we must have an incorrect address. Well, I know I'm not expecting a package, yeah. so you just you really have to be diligent, and it's tough sometimes for people. But you have to kind of realize that, uh, you know, same thing for um, Amazon. I don't have an Amazon account, but boy, they I get emails telling me that. I, you know, I just bought this. If if you didn't buy this, then send us a note or call us. And uh, I well, if you do have an Amazon account, sorry, John, just while we're on Amazon, very quickly, check your account regularly for the delivery address because somebody hacked our account and changed the delivery address. Mm -hmm. My son caught it and said, hey, did you set up a, a remote delivery site for your Amazon account? We said, no. And he said, well, there's a remote delivery site on there. Hmm. So any packages you would order, you think we're coming to your house, we're actually going to go to a remote delivery site. We were able to find that because of my son's diligence in checking that site. And we obviously changed our password and deleted that site before any damage was done. But that's something everybody with an Amazon account should be aware of. Yeah. That, that's yeah. good to know, Rob, because we use, unlike uh, uh, Dennis, I use it all the yeah. time. Change your passwords Passage, regularly. Yeah, but I use Amazon for everything. So if somebody hiked it or hacked it, rather, yeah. to go and see. Don't use password as your password, by the way. I've had success. <laughs> if 
when we've all had the same things that you're talking about, the, these kinds of alerts, if you just copy the text, the introductory text, and you put it into a search engine and it'll come up as a scam if it, if yeah. it is a scam. That's yeah. it's the test I run. And when in doubt, ignore it. They'll send it to you again. If And since it's charged with credit card, if it shows up on your credit card, you deny it and it'll go away. Yeah. So there are, there are factors built in. Now, there's a, a – belong to a, a – I guess it's a listserv. I'm not sure. Next door, it's it's like a local um, uh, Facebook kind of thing. I, I see there's a drumbeat that happens with local contractors who will take a deposit to do a thing, whatever it is, you know, five, ten thousand dollars, whatever it is, and they will start the work and then disappear with the deposit. And is that something that your office would handle? Yes, sir. And then what but, happens? But then I also tell them. See, my job is as much a, a traffic director as it is. They can, we, you can fill out a consumer complaint and put it into our office, but then I'll also tell them to call the Department of Labor, West Virginia Department of Labor, because they control contractors licensing. And that's where you would want to make a complaint against them. So then if, as other people, depending on the situation, they could be out of left town and state, and you're probably not going to see your money again. But then as long as you report it, then other people can pull it up and see see what the history is and that there's not good things going on. I get a lot, this time of year, I get a lot of contract. At, at the fair, that's one of my bigger ones is contractor complaints and situation, shoddy workmanship or, or they took the money and did a little work and left, and, and I hear that a lot. So does your office have enforcement power or are you just a traffic cop no. sort of? We don't have we don't have prosecutional powers. Um, any complaints that we get filled out, I do tell people go to the website, the West Virginia Attorney General's office website, because there is a consumer complaint file, and it's a whole lot easier to go on there and type out your complaint and hit send rather than longhand fill it out, mail it, and all that. But um, we have people down there that are true consumer advocates. That, but what they'll do is they'll send letters. And and because we don't they have, being your office yes sir, but the consumer advocates in Charleston and w before I ever came to work here I had an issue with one of our local telephone internet companies and I filled out a complaint and sure enough I heard back from them within three days and and ended up with phone numbers of people to call if I had issues and stuff people ninety percent of the time people jump at that and and it does a lot of good they get a letter from the attorney general's office they don't want they don't want to get another one now the attorney general does have prosecutional uh capabilities doesn't it no Just sir no no aspect of his office what we do i know you yourself do not i mean your office it's, the if, AG's office does not have criminal jurisdiction in West Virginia. I thought they did. Okay. No, no, no Mike Stewart wanted to get some. I say one of the yeah. candidates running that was his platform oh, okay. was to he wanted to see us get. And there's real mixed feelings about that. But um, we do have investigators, and they'll go out and investigate it diligently. And if they find something, they can then turn it over to the county prosecutor, and then it would be prosecuted from that way. Yeah, the county prosecuting attorney has basically all the power in that situation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Richard Dennis is our guest here, and the in regards to contractors, uh, does the attorney general's office put out an approved list or at least a naughty list, so to speak? No, sir, we don't. But and I handed out a, a couple pamphlets. We right. do have a pamphlet, uh, make measure measuring up. Is that what? It's, but yes. it talks about how to, if you're hiring a contractor what to look for, where to check for licensing, where to check for insurance, make sure they're insured. Can you go through and, some of that, uh, how to do that? Uh, you need to yeah, mind? well, you would, you would go through, just like we had talked about the, uh, the uh, Board of Labor, mm -hmm. to check on their licensing, make sure they're licensed, make sure it's in good standing. You go to the West Virginia Insurance Commissioner, and then you can find out that they have insurance and that that's in good standing. And that's... That's certainly an a indication that you're in the right direction anyway. It's okay. not going to give you any guarantees, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to tell you that that person is doing it right. Do we have an indication as to what percentage of unscrupulous contractors make up the general population of those who no. do this business? No. I, I would like to think it's not, a huge, it's not a huge percentage, but 
No, sir. I don't. I don't have that number. Minor. This uh, this pamphlet, uh, Measuring Up, has a lot of good information in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they can come to your office, or they can call you and get a copy. Yep. Yeah. Yep. How many people end up stopping by in, in the office, or how many do you end up working with it, in a non-fair week? <laughs> um, they don't come by the office a lot, and to be honest. I don't work out of that office mm-hmm. because I'm covering seven counties and I'm on the road an awful lot. I work out of my house and out of my car, but yeah. they do get an occasional one in there. And a lot of people will fill out the longhand complaint form and then take it in there and drop it off so that they can maybe make copies for them and do some stuff like that. Do you, do you track like a successful resolution rate? They do. They do in Charleston. They do out of the office down there. How long might it take to get some resolution? I know you mentioned well, the first letter usually scares people. And I think that's a case-by-case basis. Because mm-hmm. I had another situation, <laughs> again, before I came to work at the Attorney General's office, where a local uh, eyeglass place got bought out by another eyeglass place. And I had a guarantee and a warranty on some glasses. Well, the new place wouldn't honor that. So I went to the Attorney General's office. They sent the letter. They still refused. So, you know, you hope that they're going to do the right thing because they got the letter, but they don't always do that. Then what happens next? It, it, nothing. I just didn't. I wasn't able. It was a failure for me to not be able to get that work done. You know, <clears throat> having recently moved here and having recently built a house, a lot of people come driving up, right, and, and offering various services and products and trees and you know whatever and i find that there's a there's a west virginia way of doing business with contractors that is different than the northern virginia way of doing business (laughs) and uh, more than a few times we've done significant work and the estimate you know that the that you get is actually a number that's written on the back of the guy's business card and you get competitive bids and you we've never been let down They've always been good to their word, and the work we've had done has been quality work. But I'm looking at this, some of the suggestions, you know, make sure the contract is good and you check their references and, and all that. It's, um, it's different here than, yes. than it is in, in a lot of other communities. Just and it's way out. different here than it is in the southern part of the state. That's even more of a good old boy network down there than it is up here because of the influx of northern Virginia people and, and urban people. So, Yeah. Do the consumer protection laws that affect your job, Richard, flow mostly from the state or from the federal government? Uh, mostly from the federal government as far as consumer law goes. Does that limit or further enforce what you can do to help resolve a situation? No, I, 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 don't, think, I don't think either way. I don't think it limits it at all. But, uh, you know, and I'll tell you. To change the subject, just to tell you a yeah, few yeah. Of, the, of the scams that I see. Because I have a soft spot in my heart for senior centers and seniors. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a member of the Senior Center Board of Directors, Vice President. for and um, But there's one of the scariest things that's going on right now is AI, this artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. So first you had to worry about the, the, the scammer calling saying that your grandchild is in jail or your grandchild was in a bad wreck. We need you to send us some money. We need to take the... Well, not only do they do that now, but all they have to have is a small snippet of a, of a recording, and they can make a whole dialogue using that voice. So one of the, one of the uh, messages I give them is if, in fact, you get a call and it's from somebody pretty close and they're asking for money, they're asking things that are a little bit out of the normal, Ask them a stupid question or two, but ask them a question that they would know the answer to. And then, you know, like if it's your brother calling and, and wanting to borrow a large sum of money, well, ask him, what was, our, what was that dog's name we had when we were in the neighborhood or something like that that he would know? As long as he knows, then you can tell him. <laughs> the reason I ask you that was to make sure it's you. But there, it's really scary for this artificial intelligence and what can happen over the telephone with it. They did, I think during the Olympics, I was reading this, I think Al Michaels was hired to do an Olympic wrap up. He never had to do it because they took all of the words 
from words he'd already said in his career and made oh, the reports out I of that. I missed that, but that's interesting. Yeah, it was, a, it was an AI Al Michaels recap. <laughs> yeah, I, I did not see any actual reviews or, or results of it, but I read the buildup to it, and he was getting paid for his likeness without having to do any work for it. I'm pretty sure it was Al Michaels. Oh. If I got that name wrong, I apologize, but I'm almost positive it was Al Michaels, so they contracted to do it. So if they can make that at network level, imagine the fraud over the telephone. Yeah. So yeah. And Michelle Coffey in our Facebook audience has a very good point, too. A lot of people give away. They make this a lot easier by going on Facebook and doing these surveys. You know, what, what, what kind of Russian emperor would you be or whatever? And... They ask all of these seemingly innocent questions. You fill them out, and then you get yes. a, a satisfying response. All you're doing is you're giving yeah. intel to the bad guys, and so stop doing those. Yeah, that's a yeah. great point too. Yeah, uh, Richard, you also with this seniors. Um, it's called Protect West Virginia Seniors. I put the number in our comments section. The Senior Protection Hotline three zero four five five eight eleven fifty five. We have about two minutes left. Uh, red flags of financial abuse. For seniors, needs are not met by caregivers who have access to a senior's finances, unexplained changes made in wills, power of attorney, bank accounts. This can be financially debilitating if you give this kind of power away. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the sad thing is most of that abuse happens from somebody who is familiar to the person, whether it's a relative, whether it's somebody who's working close with them as a as a uh housekeeper or something like that and, mm -hmm. and that's most of the time it's somebody like that who's who's stealing from them do you get many cases like this um i don't personally because most of them go either go to the hotline or I, I give them the number to the hotline so they we got some professionals that can that can deal with that All right. what county are you headed to next uh this week it's kind of a slow week because i just got finished seven days in a row at the at the Jefferson County Fair, but I'm going to be in Hardy County on Wednesday and probably Hampshire County on Friday. Do you go to senior centers there, basically, or what? These, not this time. One of the other things that we do, we have a book called On the Mark, which is regulations and information on your concealed carry gun permit. So I go all my gun stores and hand those out, and uh, it's a brand new, just came off the press at the state fair last week, so I'll be going around to my gun shops and handing those out to the owners there. How do you announce your presence and where you'll be and when will you be in a particular county? Megaphone. It's, <laughs> with my voice, he said get closer to the microphone. I don't even need a microphone. But uh, in the paper for the okay. mobile office hours, it's in all the all the little weeklies out there. I'll put them in there. And uh, besides that, I just make appearances. And, you know, I stop at all the courthouses and mm -hmm. talk to all the county clerks and the circuit clerks and find out what's going on with them and just make a presence. Richard, thanks so much for stopping by. Glad to be here. It's, it's an honor to be a part of the group. <laughs> it's great to have you here. Hey, thank you all. Wonderful to see you again. Richard thanks. Dennis from the Attorney General's Office at uh, 931 